Good morning and thank you for joining us today at Mount Pisgah Church. Today we're going to be looking at the church in Philadelphia. No, not Philadelphia in the United States, but Philadelphia in Asia Minor. The one church that Jesus had nothing but positive things to say about it. We're going to find out what some of those positive things were about the opportunities that they had and the authority that they had and not having to live in fear. If you're ever in the Apex, North Carolina area, feel free to join us on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, 1288 Mount Pisgah Church Road. We'd love to have you. And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to put them down in the comment section down below. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours both now and evermore. All right, well, let's open up to Revelation chapter 3. We are getting close to finishing up with the seven churches. We'll finish up with Laodicea next week, and then we'll begin to jump into some bigger portions of Scripture as we go through this letter because the pictures and the symbolism is going to start to expand once John is as it were, caught up into heaven to see and gain the perspective. Remember, this is an apocalyptic letter. And apocalypses always were comprised of several important things, which is important to remember as we go through it. One, you have an individual who has been chosen by God to see something. There are angels heavily involved in this unveiling, and that's what an apocalypse is. It is an unveiling. And this individual is generally taken by angelic beings under the direction of God behind the scenes, behind the curtain, to see what's really going on, to see what's really happening in the realm that matters, the spiritual realm that has direct impact upon this physical world. And so as we saw when we started looking at this letter, everything that John is going to see, Jesus is telling him that I'm giving you this apocalypse by means of signs and symbols. So it's important to understand as we go through it, what do the symbols represent? And the symbols, for the most part, all of them we're going to find back in the, under the Old Covenant, back in the Old Testament. And we'll see there the significance they had for the people of God then, and then what application does it have as John is being shown to it. And we're going to see that this morning, especially with this church here in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia was kind of on the southern stretch of where these letters started. We started on the west coast there of Asia Minor with Ephesus. We moved our way up north. We made the turn, and we're starting back down now. And Philadelphia is right just above where Laodicea is located, and we're headed south. And so as we come to this letter, this is an interesting one. Because this is a letter, these brothers and sisters in this church, there is not one word of reproof that Jesus has for them. Not one word of correction. He finds this fellowship in high approval rating in the courts of heaven. I mean, they have walked and they have kept and they have guarded his commands, as we'll see. And they have stayed faithful to him even in the midst of some severe hardship and persecution, they've not denied his name. They've not turned his back on him, their back on him. And so he is going to reward them for that. He is going to reward them for their faithfulness and make some very significant promises to them as a, a group of folks. So we begin in verse 7 of Revelation 3. And it says, And to the angel of the assembly in Philadelphia write, He who is holy... He who is true, and he who has the key of David. He who opens, and no one can shut, and who shuts, and no one can open, says these things. I know your works. And behold, I've set before you an open door, which no one can shut. You have a little power, and you've kept my word, and you didn't deny my name. Behold, I give some of the synagogue of Satan, of those who say they are Jews and they are not, but lie. Behold, he says, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. 
Because you've, command, you, you've kept my command to endure, you've kept the word of my endurance, my, the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, which is about to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold firmly that which you have so that no one takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will go out from there no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies, the gatherings, the community of believers. And again, this is for all believers at all times. Not just for Philadelphia, but he says, listen to what I'm saying to this group of people because it has application for you. Now, Philadelphia was an interesting city. Of course, we know from the Philadelphia here in the United States, it is the city of brotherly what? Love. So evidently, these guys in this fellowship had gotten that right. They had lived out what love was supposed to be in its expression with one another as brothers and sisters. They were living out the reality of learning to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love one another as Jesus had loved them. And they were demonstrating that. And they demonstrated that by their commitment to God as well as their commitment to one another from the inception of this church. Now, Philadelphia was about 30 miles east of the city of Sardis. Remember, we're going up. So Sardis is over here, and you've got Philadelphia over here. And it was on the Imperial Post Road, the way the mail would run, on the way to Laodicea. And it was really considered to be sort of a frontier town when it was founded, and even at the time this letter was written. It was on the border of Greek-speaking Lydia to the west, and then Phrygia, which was considered very barbaric, to their east. One scientist said that Philadelphia was considered to be a missionary city by the Greek culture because one of the reasons it was founded was to spread the Greek culture and language to the east toward those, what they considered those barbaric Phrygians. And it was successful because many of the local Lydians by the first century became Greek speakers and they had all but forgotten their native tongue. Now, it's interesting when you think about this because, again, even in something so simple as this, you see God's hand at work preparing people to learn a language prior to the gospel coming to them so that they will be able to receive the message of the gospel when Paul comes and, and Paul and Silas and, and Barnabas would make their way through this area. They were in a position to understand and hear it. So God used a human plan to develop culturally a people who had, were considered pagan by the Greeks to learn their language the Greeks were thinking it was just so they could cult, you know, get these people you know, culturalized in a sense. But in reality, God was getting these people ready to be able to hear the gospel when it came to them and to receive the message and to pave the way. Now, Sardis, along with 10 other cities back in 17 AD, were damaged very heavily by an earthquake. And the city of Philadelphia, because of that earthquake, they, would continue, they continued for a great while experiencing a, a number of very severe aftershocks. And the, re, the, the, the result of that was that many times the, they, they could not get comfortable in their homes, so they would constantly be fleeing out of the street. So the result of that was a lot of them moved out from the city into the surrounding countryside. And they sort of abandoned, in a lot of, a lot of cases, the, the city itself and kind of moved away. And so they went out for safer pasture outside in the country. But this city, Philadelphia, survived all of the other cities as far as, as its existence is concerned. Ephesus fell, Smyrna fell, Laodicea fell, and now if you go over there, you find these places, they're all ruins. You're visiting ruins. But you can still go to the city of what was Philadelphia. It's a little sunny Turkish city known as Alas Sahir. 
And you can still visit the city of Philadelphia, and it's well known today for its sultana raisins. Now, when Jesus talks to this group of believers, we have a good idea that, again, we're not talking to a large mega church. Again, there was no, like we know, mega churches today. There were no mega churches back then. And again, throughout this city, it could have been a handful of people, or it could have been, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100 people, may have been more. But usually, if they did come together in one place, that would have been kind of unusual, although in the beginning, because primarily a lot of them may have been Jewish, they still gathered at the synagogue, and we'll find that in just a little bit. That's primarily where a lot of the converts came from initially, when, when the gospel first came to this area. But then they, because of the persecution that came from some of the Jewish people, they may have scattered out, began to meet in homes, gathered together, went in where they could to worship God. But again, Jesus looks at a city. He doesn't see a bunch of churches. He sees how many churches? One church. Wherever he sees, he sees one body, one people. And as he introduces himself again, he's, we find all this stuff back in the first chapter of Revelation other than we're going to see this next week in Laodicea, Jesus makes some distinctions about himself that are not found in the first chapter. But we can always go back and we can always see these are given when John was initially confronted by the presence of Christ in chapter 1. And he tells them, this is the one there in verse 7 who is holy, who is true, and he has the key of David. He possesses the key of David. Now, Jesus is not merely the Lord. He says, but I am the Holy One, and I am the true one. That means I am the real deal. I'm the genuine one. Everything else in comparison to me is false. I'm the true, and I am the living God. I am the Holy One. He is not just holy and true. He is the Holy One and the true one. One And so in a whole world that's been corrupted and marred by sin and by death, Jesus is perfection personified. And he is taking two significant titles, applying them to himself, that in the Old Testament were reserved strictly for Adonai, for God the Father, the God of Israel. And again, Jesus is saying, he and I are one. When you see me, you see the Father. When you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I'm not subservient in that sense to him. I'm not less than him. He and I are equal, and we are one. And he's addressing, again, a group of believers who are mixed, primarily starting out with Jews and then ultimately Gentiles coming in to the fellowship. And so when he made these references to himself, the Jews especially understood exactly what he was saying. When he called himself the Holy One and the True One, he was the God of Israel, the God of truth. Basically, Jesus is saying, look, I am the holy and true revelation of the holy and true God. And again, that evokes a sense of worship and adoration from us as his people because he is the true, he is the real one distinct from everyone and everything that is false. And then he says, I'm the one that holds and has the key of David. That's a very interesting statement. I mean, what is this key? Well, when a Jew is sitting there in that assembly and it's, this letter is being read and they, it, Jesus refers to himself as the one having the key of David, immediately they know exactly what he's talking about. They have a reference for this statement and the significance of it in the Old Testament. This key was a key that unlocked the door to King Hezekiah's palace. And there was someone who was a steward who was responsible for possessing that key. And he was the one that gave access to anyone who would come in to see the king. He was able to determine who could go in and see and have audience with the king because he was the one responsible for having the key. 
you want to see this, go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 22. And it's, it's interesting, especially how, how Isaiah records this, and Jesus is using it here with the church of Philadelphia, the significance of what he's saying. In Isaiah chapter 22, beginning down in verse 15. Isaiah 22, 15. He says, this is what the Lord, Adonai, Svaot, the Lord, God of hosts, says. Go, get yourself to the treasurer, even to Shebna, who is over the house, and say, what are you doing here? Who has you here? That you have dug out a tomb here. Cutting himself out a tomb on high, carrying and carving a habitation for himself in the rock. Behold, God says, Adonai will overcome you and hurl you away violently, and he will grasp you firmly. He will surely wind you around and around and throw you like a ball into a large country. There you will die, and there the chariots of your glory will be, and the shame of your master's house. I will thrust you from your office. You will be pulled down from your station. It will happen in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe. I will strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your governor, your king, into his hand, and he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will lay the key of whose house? David's house on his what? Shoulders. And he says, and he will open and no one will shut. He will shut and no one will open. And I will fasten him like a nail into a sure place, and he will be for a throne of glory to his father's house. What the Lord is saying basically this is Shebna has been an unfaithful servant, and God is basically saying that, look, I am going to take the key away from him, and I'm going to give it to Eliakim, a faithful servant, and Eliakim then will be the one who makes the decision who can go in and see the king and who cannot. He will be the one who will open and no one can shut, and he will be the one who will shut and no one can open. And Jesus here in Revelation takes that passage and quotes it directly and completely and applies it to himself. So the Jews listen, oh, yeah, I remember the story of Shebna and Eliakim, and Eliakim was given the key. So what is the significance of this? Jesus is saying, look, I am the one who has the authority. I am the one who has the keys to the kingdom. I have the keys to the kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through or by me. You don't get to the heavenly Father except through me. I am the one who opens the way. I am the way. You don't get to the Father except through him. But he's just, Jesus is not just a gatekeeper, but he is the one upon the key is laid upon his shoulder. And again, in Isaiah, Isaiah saw this, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he talks about, he says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His shoulder, he will bear the authority and wear the authority of the government of the kingdom of God. He is the son of David. He sits upon the throne of David. Mary was told this, that he would sit upon David's throne and he would rule from that place for all the ages to come, having the key of David. All the riches, all the resources, resources of heaven are found solely in Christ and they are at his disposal. Religious people and religion always tries to control access to who gets in and who gets out. Religion always likes to decide who's good enough to merit coming into heaven. Religion likes to dictate that. And Jesus even noted the fact that the Jews were like this. He says, you yourselves observe, when he talked to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he said, you observe all these things, but he says, you yourselves do not 
enter, nor will you let those who are trying to enter, enter. They were thinking they held the key as to who got in and who didn't and making that decision. And here's the interesting thing. When you look at names, Shebna and Eliakim have interesting names. Shebna, his name meant vigor, energy, vitality. But Eliakim's name meant resurrected of God. Religion likes to have its vigor and its vitality to control people and manipulate them. You do this and you get in. You don't, you don't. But Jesus, when he died on the cross, did away with and put to death religion. He dealt with it once and for all. And as the resurrected one, he now provides access to the Father. And guess what he's done? The way is open to how many? All. No one is excluded. No one is left out. Eliakim would open the door and invite all to come in to Hezekiah. You see, in Philadelphia, the religious Jews who were there, which we'll see in a minute, they were making it very difficult for people to turn to God. They were putting all these regulations and rules and stipulations as to what you had to do to get in. And Jesus is saying they don't have that authority. They were hindering the gospel. They were opposing the believers there. But Jesus wanted the church to know that he holds the key. He is the one that can shut any door that he opens, and no man can shut whatever he himself opens. And then you go back to Revelation 3, and you notice what Jesus says to them about his praise for them. In verse 8, I know your works. I know, I know. I'm there. I'm intimately involved. I know the secrets. I know the good. I know the bad. I know all of it. I know everything. But he says, see, I've set before you an open door which no one can shut. You have a little power. You've kept my word, and you did not deny my name. The deeds that these people were doing were beautiful before Jesus. They weren't anything that caused any grief to his heart. They were beautiful to him. And he says, I have set before you an open door. Now, when you think about Scripture, obviously, we think about an open door being symbolic of opportunity. I've set an opportunity for you here. I've made a way for you. I have opened a door of possibility, especially when it comes to sharing the gospel. Paul talked about this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. He said, the Lord set before me an open door in Ephesus an opportunity to share the message. He mentions it to the Colossians in Colossians 4, verse 3. Same kind of thing. God has set before me an open door, the opportunity to share the message. But it also can have another significance. It can also be significant in relationship to the tomb, the grave. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, if you, if you just go back a page or two there, notice what Jesus says about himself when he's being revealed to John in verse 17 and 18. Notice what he says. He says, and when, he, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he laid his right hand on me saying, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last, the living one, I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of Hades and death. I possess those keys. And when Jesus tells the church at Philadelphia that he is setting before them an open door, there is sort of a hearkening back. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. In Matthew 16, when Jesus made this statement to Peter, when Peter made his confession about Jesus, being the Messiah. In Matthew 16, verses 18 through 20, Jesus told Simon, he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my assembly, and the gates of Hades, Sheol, or death, will not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
And whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. The picture here that Jesus is giving to them when he says the gates of Hades will not prevail, we always think that it's the church going against the gates of Hades and tearing them down. No. Gates keep people not just out, but they keep people where? In. Jesus has the keys to unlock the gate. Why? To let the people out of death to release them from the bondage and fear and captivity of death. Resurrection. The death will not hold you. You don't have to be afraid of it. It didn't hold me, and it's not going to hold you either because I am the one that has the keys. So there's no need to be afraid of it. And so he tells this church in Philadelphia, look, I've set before you an open door An open door, opportunity, and you don't have to be afraid of death at all because I'm the one who has the keys. Jesus opens all doors. There is not a door, if he wants it open, that can stand against him. doesn't matter what it is. There's no man. If Jesus wants to provide an opportunity for you in life, Jesus wants you to go through a door. He has the power and the authority to open it. There's nothing the devil can do. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to stop him from opening that door. Now, whether we go through those doors is another story. Jesus didn't say, I set before you an open door and I'll throw you through it. He says, the door's open. You have to make the choice as to whether you're going to go through it or not whether you're going to walk through and pursue what I want you and I'm inviting you into to come and follow me through that door. When Paul and Barnabas came back from their missionary journey in Acts 14, 27, they gave to the church at Antioch their report, and they heard Paul and Barnabas talk about God opening a door of faith to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were walking through it by the masses coming to know Christ. He tells them, he says, listen, he says, you you, you have a little power. They're a small group of people. He recognizes this. He he acknowledges your small group of people. I understand that. You may not have a lot of influence from the standpoint of what the world considers having great influence by numbers, but you have influence where it matters in the spiritual realm. And you have a testimony there that's sticking You have a testimony that I know about. And that testimony is this. You kept my word. You guarded my word. You guarded my commands with your heart because you love my commands. You love the things that I've asked you to do. And you've guarded them. You've guarded them by obeying them. You followed me through the open doors that I've provided for you in life. You've been faithful to me. And not only that, he says, you didn't deny my name. And remember, We know exactly what he's talking about. All those believers being called before the Roman government there each time, once a year at least, where they either had to offer up incense and say Caesar is Lord or deny him. And if they denied that confession, they suffered sometimes death, martyrdom, slaughtered in the Colosseum by wild animals or slaughtered by gladiators or they lost every possession they had. Their homes were taken from them. Their jobs were taken from him but Jesus says when that time faced you you didn't deny me you stood proudly and refused to bow the knee to Caesar you refused to simply make that declaration with your lips Caesar is Lord and offer a little bit of incense and go home safe and secure and sound no you stood faithful to me you did not deny my name And he says to them, listen, I'm going to promise you, I'm going to make some promises to you starting in verse 9, some powerful promises. One, he says, behold, I give some of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they're Jews and they're not, and we already have discovered a few churches back who those guys are. They are the jihadists, the Jewish jihadists of the day. They were the extremists in the synagogue who hated Christianity, who persecuted Christianity. All those who follow Jesus, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, they hated the way. And so whatever they could do to cause trouble for those Christians, they were causing problems for them. And he says, I know, but he says, I 
am going to do something to them. Those are of the synagogue of Satan, because remember, Satan is an accuser. And these Jews would go and accuse these Christians of many things to get them in trouble. And so he says, I know those who are of the synagogue of Satan, those who say they're Jews, they are not. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Now again, Jesus is taking a very explicit prophecy in the Old Testament stating this. And it was a prophecy concerning the Jewish people. And Jesus is saying, that prophecy, I'm taking it and I'm turning it and I'm applying it to you guys. Just listen to this reference. You see, the Jewish expectation in these prophecies was that in the age to come, that all the nations would come and give humble homage to the Jews because they were God's people. That was what they believed. And it occurs over and over many times in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah. In Isaiah 60, 14, the descendants of those who oppressed you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. Isaiah 45, 14, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Ethiopia and the Sabians, tall of stature, shall come over to you and be yours and they shall follow you and they shall come over in chains and bow down to you. Isaiah 49, 23, kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Zechariah said he had a vision of the day when all the people in all nations and languages will turn to Jerusalem and says they shall take hold of a Jew, grasping his garment, saying, let us go to you, for we have heard that God is with you. And Jesus is taking these prophecies and he's saying, nope, what they thought that there was going to be done for them, I'm going to turn the tables and they're going to come to you. My people, both Jew and Gentile, And those Jews who are the accusers are going to come and bow down at your feet. I'm going to make them know that I have loved you. I've not rejected you. You're my people, both Jew and Gentile who have trusted me. And what's interesting is, well, how will that happen? How how, how would this be? You remember there was a dude named Paul. Prior to him becoming who we know as Paul, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And what was he out doing? Persecuting Christians, murdering them, putting them in jail, all of those things. And then he had an encounter with Jesus. And when he had that encounter with Jesus and he became a new creation, the first people he went to were the believers. He was taken to them. And don't you think that he had a very broken and repentant heart? I'm sorry for what I've done to you. I repent. This is the way they'll come. Jesus is basically saying, look, maybe the open door was going to be to reach those people. When they come to me, they will come and they will say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry what I did to you guys. Forgive me. It's not that they were going to come and worship and give them, you know, any kind of heavenly adoration or anything like that. It is a picture of repentance. Jesus is saying, I'm going to get a hold of them and I'm going to change them. And they're going to come, and they're going to acknowledge their sin against me, but also against you, and I'm going to bring you together. See, that's what Jesus is all about. He's all about healing the broken places. He's all about restoring what's been messed up and broken and has been destroyed and hacked apart by the enemy and bringing unity where there's been division and conflict. His judgment is always good. Even though it may be painful to go through, it always ends up being restorative in its purpose. I'll do that, and they will know that I've loved you. Why will they know that I've loved you? Because they will know me, and they'll understand then that I love them as well. He says, you have kept the word of my perseverance you've kept my command to endure it is the word of his perseverance of jesus perseverance it has to do with jesus hebrews 12 1 and 2 
laying aside the weights and all of those things which will easily encumber us, he said, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross patiently. He despised the shame. You've kept the word of my endurance, my gospel, about what I went through for the whole world. You've been obedient to that. You've guarded that. You've protected it. You too have been patient in your suffering. There may be suffering now, but you know that in the hereafter, there's not going to be suffering. And he says, not only that, he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing, which is going to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. There's a great trial coming, he says, and when it comes, I'm going to protect you through it. And possibly what many believe, a lot of people read this and say, oh, Jesus is talking about the tribulation one day when the, at the end times. Please tell me, what relevance would that have had for people 2,000 years ago? None. Of course they'd be kept from it because they are all dead. But he's making a specific promise, and he's basically saying, I'm going to keep you from something that's about to happen. I'm going to protect you through it. Most believe that what Jesus is making reference to was the persecution, a fresh wave of it, that was getting ready to break out against the church in various places. And Jesus was basically telling them, look, you guys have been through enough already. I'm not going to let it get here to you. I'm going to watch and protect you through it. I'll see you through it. I'm not going to let it come here. And we need to understand that as we follow Jesus, sometimes it puts us in difficult places. And we may face difficult days. We know that in the world we live in today, everything is so topsy-turvy and confusing. Right is wrong, wrong is right. Black is white, white is black. The whole world seems to be upside down in very many ways, and it seems like in, against Christians especially, and those who follow Christ, the world is closing in, and things, we may face some very difficult days ahead of us. But here's the thing we need to understand. Jesus didn't promise that he would preserve us from those times, but he did say, I will preserve you through them. We can trust him. No matter what we go through, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you i'm with you i will protect you he says in verse 11 i'm coming quickly hold firmly that which you have so no one takes your crown he's coming quickly he says like we saw last week be ready be prepared be alert be on the lookout hold fast he says that which you have guard what you've got Guard my word, guard your commitment to me so you don't lose your crown. That does not mean you're going to lose your salvation. What many believe that Jesus is making reference to is don't lose your opportunity that I'm getting ready to set before you. Don't blow it as you're coming to the end of the race. You're getting close to the finish line. Don't get tripped up and fall along the way and miss the opportunity that I'm setting in front of you. In the early teaching in the Didache, when they used to teach people in the early church, it says, watch over your life. Don't let your lamp burn out, nor your waist be ungirded, but be ready, for you don't know when our Lord is coming. And gather together frequently, seeking what is necessary for your souls, for all your years of faith will count for nothing unless you're perfected in the last days. That's a way of them saying the same thing. Keep gathering together, keep growing, finish well. Finish well. Don't become a shipwreck before you cross the finish line. Most of us in here, reality is, you know, if the Scripture says we're allowed 70 years and if God peradventure give us 10 more to 80, it's It's good. So if we go by that kind of thing, we break up life like quarters in a ball game. Most of us in here are in the fourth quarter, aren't we? Some of us are on the four, in the fourth quarter, and we've got 12 minutes left, five minutes left, three minutes left. Some of us are living on overtime 
after the fourth quarter. We're cramming for finals. Getting close. And what Paul, Peter, all those guys learned and made statements about in their letters and what Jesus is telling these guys, look, you're getting ready to in the home stretch. Finish well. Don't blow the opportunity that I set before you. And it's not a question of somebody stealing their crown from them. When he says don't lose it, basically that God is giving an opportunity to you. Don't blow the opportunity and God has to give it to somebody else because you failed to go through the door. God's going to get something done. He wants something done on the other side of that door. He wants you to be the one to get it done. Don't let it be a result of him having to give it to someone else. And look in the times of Scripture when people lost their place to somebody else because they were not fit to hold it. They didn't finish well. Esau lost his place to Jacob. Reuben, Scripture says, unstable as water, lost his place to Judah. Saul lost his place to David. Shebna lost his place to Eliakim. Joab and Abiathar and the priesthood, they lost their places to Benaiah and Zadok. They lost it. Judas lost his place to Matthias. There's the possibility, not your salvation, but an opportunity. Jesus doesn't want us to stand before him one day and look at, look, I had a door open for you to go through, and you didn't go through it. Man, this could have been a great experience for you, but you missed it. Now, I got done when I wanted to get done, but I wanted so much for you to go through that door. But you missed the opportunity. Jesus said, look, I'm going to do some things for you all. Here's my promise. He says, he who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out from there no more. A pillar. A pillar is a picture of strength. It's a picture of stability, of honor. You're not going to go out. Remember what I said in the beginning about the earthquakes? Again, this is the reference here. You're not constantly going in your house but living in an unstable dwelling, and then when a tremor happens, you run out. For fear. No, you're not going to be running out anymore like that. There's stability, there's security, there's honor I will give to you. And he says, not only that, he says, I am going to write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of the New Jerusalem and my new name. The name of God. It's interesting. The cities there that they were dwelling in, especially in Philadelphia, when a priest would die. After a lifetime of faithfulness, he was honored by a pillar being erected in one of the temple of their gods, and they would be honored by having his name inscribed on the pillar and also the name of his father upon the pillar. And it would do a lasting honor. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you all a lasting honor in my kingdom. And it's also the possibly a reference to where slaves they would be branded by the initials of their owners would be shown to whom they belong. And we will see later on that God puts his mark on his people, his name, his identification. These people belong to me. They are mine. And then, of course, remember when God told Moses in the Arianic blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. He said, in this way, you will put my name upon my people. Jesus says, I'll put the name of the city of my God upon them. The new Jerusalem, he says, that is coming down from heaven out of God. Their citizenship is in the city of God. And according to Ezekiel, again, these are Old Testament references. Ezekiel 48, 35, it says that the city will be named Adonai is there. The last verse of Ezekiel 48, 35. That's the name. God is there. And then in Jeremiah, the name of the city will be the Lord, my righteousness. In Jeremiah 33, 16 and 17. The Lord, my righteousness. That's the name of the city. He's taking these places. Again, they understood the references there. The faithful ones. Those who have overcome will know the presence of God. He's there, and he is their righteousness, their strong tower. And then Jesus' new name. Jesus says, I will write on you my new name. 
You know, the people of Philadelphia knew all about taking a new name. When the seven, in AD 17, when the earthquake destroyed their city, Tiberius the Caesar, he dealt very kindly with them and he canceled all their taxation and he made a generous gift to have the city rebuilt. And so in their gratitude, they named the city Neo Caesarea, the new city of Caesar. Later, when Vespasian was kind to them, they changed it and called it Flavia. That was the name of the family of Vespasian. So these, again, Jesus is taking things they're familiar with, and he said, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to put my new name upon you, a name that will mark his faithful ones. What that name is, we don't know. Can't even speculate it. It says it's a name that only he knows right now. But he's going to place that name in it. We will bear the badge which shows, and we will share in his triumph with him in the end. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. Listen to what I'm saying. What do we take away from this little church? Well, we can take away several things. One, you and I do not need to fear death at all. We run to death. We don't fear it. Because we remember who has the authority and the key. He does. He's got it. Secondly, seize the opportunities that God gives us every day. Some of us have some opportunities that are big. Some of them that just may be minuscule. It may be an opportunity just to say a kind word to somebody. It may be an opportunity to give somebody something that the Lord prompts you to do for them. It may be an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. It may be an opportunity for a new venture in life. Maybe a big opportunity. Opportunities come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. But when God opens the door, walk through it. When God opens the door, he's opening the door. There's no need, oh, Lord, let me pray about this. You never go wrong doing the loving thing. The loving thing will always be the right thing. Seize the opportunities. Three, our strength, our honor, our stability in this life comes through being in Jesus. My stability and my confidence are not determined by what the news says every morning when I get up. It's not dependent upon what the 10-year yield is in the stock market or how the stock market's doing. My stability is not dependent on a job that I have or an income that I get or you get. It's not dependent on Social Security. None of that. None of that. Your stability, my stability, our security. God may use those things to provide for us, but we can't put our trust and our confidence in those things because they can all be gone in an instant. Our stability is being in Christ. We're pillars in his temple. We're in him. And that's where our trust and our confidence is. And the final thing is this. Finish well. Finish well. Make the last part of your race the best part of your race. Best part. There are people today who are sitting in homes, in churches sometimes, with so much regret. I know guys who were faithful to the Lord for 20, 25, 30 years, and then at some, something happened, something took place, and they walked away from Jesus. They've turned their back. They've grown bitter. They've grown harsh. They're not finishing well. Finish well. Love God. Love other people. Obey him, follow him, trust him. Cross that finish line with a smile. Excited. Knowing, as Paul said, the prize that is set before you. Don't get distracted by the sideline stuff. Don't get distracted by it. And get off course. Finish.
Father, thank you for your goodness and grace, and thank you for your word. Help us to heed what you have told these brothers and sisters here, our brothers and sisters. We may be 2,000 years removed from them, but I pray that you will help us all to seize the opportunities given to us every day, big and little, and to finish well the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In his name we pray.